Aloha. It's June the 15th, 2022. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. That can mean only one thing. Time for American Issues, take one. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And with me today is a bit of a reunion show. Uh, we have Winston Welch, who's been on assignment for many, many months. I know that he's been uh, working on a lot of stories. <laughs> and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Welcome, you guys. Welcome back. Good morning. Aloha. Um, I kind of went out there with the title for the show today because it, the title lent itself to what's the topic of the day. And the title is Trump Goes with Drunk Rudy, Big Lie is Born. Uh, you know, what's in the title? Everything. And what have we been finding out from uh, the select committee's hearings? A lot. A lot of it we've known, but uh, I think the value of the hearings is that they're putting it together in a story that we can actually get our arms around. Remember the Mueller investigation? Uh, it was so convoluted and there were so many um, exits and on-ramps to what was going on that I don't think the American public could grasp it. And it didn't take much for Bill Barr to decouple the reality of the Mueller investigation from its complexity. And so here we are with a very complex issue of January 6th, how that happened, who was involved. And, but the hearing select committee is doing, I think, a wonderful job of putting the pieces of the puzzle together and, and telling a story. Um, so without further ado, let's go to that question. Uh, Winston, to you first. What, what new things do you think we've learned from, this, uh, from these two hearings? Well, I, you know, I, I was talking with someone about this, asking, have you been watching the hearings? And she said, no, there's no new information in there. I, I, don't, I don't think we heard anything, but that's not true. There's a lot of new information from all of these, these guests. They've had a year and a half basically to do a methodical plotting um, uh, analysis of what's gone on. And uh, that actually, you know, I, they've been criticized for not coming out sooner, uh, for not doing this. You know, we're a year and a half out on this thing. But uh, that said, this sort of work needs painstaking research. It needed to have the people that they had on board. And what we're seeing out of this is this was not uh, insurrectionist or rioters. This is, is being uh, shown for what it is, which was a full frontal coup attempt on overturning the peaceful transition of power from one election to another. Uh, and it's being led in as bipartisan a manner as could possibly be done because the, uh, you know, the House Republican leadership would not really participate in this because some of them are complicit in this, as we found out as well in these in these uh, hearings. But that said, having the the way that this has gone about, and Liz Cheney is a brilliant um, uh, leader in this, and the way that she laid it out, and I had heard on one commentary that she'd been a federal prosecutor for twenty years, but the way that this was laid out, uh, as one commentator said was textbook classic case of what they were going to do how they were going to do it it was not hysterical it was not dramatic it was very matter of fact laying out what it is i want to i want to go to that point i want to go to that point because one of the things that impressed me is a lot of times uh in the hearings and i think we saw some of this in the impeachment hearings is a, a tendency for um committee members to grandstand a bit and, and what I haven't noticed is any committee member, as they're asking their questions, any hint of grandstanding or trying to paint this for a political advantage. Uh, what I'm seeing is a outlay of facts and testimony and witness testimony. Uh, your impression on that point? Yeah, I, I would agree. I'm not seeing any any of that. I, I think what may have surprised people is just sort of laying this right at the feet of Donald Trump. But it's not just Donald Trump. There's an entire movement behind him that wanted to support this. So while he, um, you, you know, is rightly being put where it is, they're calling out the other people behind it. And I think part of their really brilliant strategy here is to have people that were involved in his inner circle, the Bill Bars, his campaign chairman, uh, who had, you know, his wife had the baby the day of the uh, the, uh, the testimony yes. earlier. Uh, these are these were deep. Um, uh, they had, uh, who was the, uh, Ginsburg, the lawyer, I mean, that, that, that fought Bush v. Gore. These are dyed in the wool, 
Republicans. And not only that, these are part of the inner circle of Donald Trump from the very beginning. People that that uh, we probably have reviled a little bit on some of the actions that they've taken, but those have been, um, I think all sins are absolved on some level because they are actually standing up when Bill Barr stands up and says, this is the way that it is. When you have Liz Cheney, who is was number three in the House leadership on the Republican side, daughter of Vice President Cheney. I mean, these are not liberals. The, she voted with Donald Trump 90% of the time. But when she sees a coup attempt that's just out to destroy what she understands as her nation, uh, this is really remarkable. This is not liberal Democrats banging the, the pan. This is going to the source of the Republicans that were all around it. And most important is what uh, one of the witnesses or one of the uh, uh, committee members said was this is not a Democrat issue. This is not a Republican issue. This is an American issue. And these folks are standing up as Americans and saying this was wrong and this is what I saw. And this is uh, the, the factual um, presentation of what's happened. All right. Yeah. Great points, Winston. Appreciate that. Uh, Cynthia, you know, Winston brings up the point, the fact that all this testimony is coming from more or less Trump's inner circle. Uh, I would think that lends a little bit more credibility and to, I'm sure to Republicans, they don't like to see that. They don't like to see uh, come out against other Republicans. But when it comes to attempted coups, I guess that's what you might expect. But uh, anyway, to you, a uh, same question. Uh, what have you learned uh, out of these two hearings that maybe you didn't know before uh, to, to that point? Well. Um, first off, let, let's just define what a coup is, right? A coup is the overthrow or alteration of a legitimate government by abusing power or through violence. So it's an ongoing coup, right, <laughs> that some of these people are, are going with. I think the guy that struck me the most, made, made the most effect, I thought, was that Ben Ginsburg guy who was involved in the 1990, um, or no, the 2000 Florida um, mm -hmm. uh, recount stuff, investigation and all that. And he just stood up and said, there was no evidence. You know? And he told Trump that. So I think that's an important thing. They're trying to establish um, if he did know, if there was anything, you know, behind what he was doing, did he just believe that he really did win or did he know better? And that's what I see them very carefully laying out is how many times he was told that there was no fraud. Well, that, I think that's the point is that you had, I think it was Alex Cannon, who was the, kind of the data guy who, right. who looked at election night results and said, not looking good. Uh, the trends are not looking good. And do n I would not recommend going out on election night at one in the morning or two in the morning. I was up to watch that and say that you've, you've, you've won the elections. I would not recommend that. And then Mark Meadows, chief of staff said, okay, so there is no there there. Um, so despite the constant advice that he got, Trump wouldn't have any part of it. Didn't want to listen to it. So what did he do? He tried it out. And, um, went with, yeah, I won the election. And if I don't win, then this whole thing's a fraud. So he set, you know, he set the stage on election night. Right. Uh, and I think maybe, uh, may, maybe they had announced Arizona at that time. Um, and that's what I think angered Trump the most is that, CN, uh, excuse me, uh, Fox News actually aired uh, the, the Arizona results. And I don't think they were happy about that. No, they fired the guy. Was, yes, they uh, did for telling was, for telling uh, the truth. Firewalt, yeah, yeah, for telling the truth. They they terminated them, and guess what? That's what every news organization should do: is fire your 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 executive director for telling the truth. Wow. So, any other thing, uh, Cynthia, that you thought that caught your eye on these last two hearings that um, that you really didn't know before, or um, other than Ginsburg? Well, as far as things that we didn't know before, here on ThinkTech, we really follow the news. So we are 
pretty much familiar with all the stuff they're presenting, right? But the average Joe that just watches the evening news, he's getting all kinds of new stuff. So I'm not really seeing a whole lot of new things that we didn't already kind of know happened. But now what they're doing, and I think that another thing that's behind all this is you know, one of the questions is who are they trying to reach with this, right? Who's mm-hmm. their target audience? This is my opinion. History is their target audience. All of this is getting, you know, tr- transcribed, you know, black and white history. And there's going to be no denying it. There's no change in it. There's, and they're being very careful to stay away from opinion and just deal with facts. And, and I think that's really great. And I noticed the same thing. There's no grandstanding, right? How wonderful to be able to air down all of that, you know, look how great I am. See over here, let me gaslight you now um, kind of stuff. It's gone. And they can just go right straight to the heart of the matter. And I think that's brilliantly put together and really well executed. Yeah. You know, if I was in the audience as a candidate for 2024 for the president of the United States, I'd, I'd be watching this very carefully and watching this report that's going to be produced because as an audience member, I might want to take the, the report and plop it down on a judge's desk and say, here's my brief. Um, president Trump, former President Trump, has no legal standing to enter in the president of the United States under the 14th Amendment, paragraph three. And here's my brief t- to prove it. Uh, so there might be a future audience that we haven't really thought about yet, but um, any candidate with standing uh, certainly could could run with this. We'll see. Time oh, will tell. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I totally hey, agree with that. <laughs> I mean, who knows? Any one of us here on the show could run for president of the United States. And, and what's to prevent us from filing a suit? Winston, when are Winston. you running? <laughs> Winston, I'm when are you running for, for office? <laughs> Dog catcher. Uh, and even then, I don't want to catch dogs. It's hard enough just to be to be an informed citizen, honestly. That people that run and stand for office with noble, uh, valuable principles are are honorable people for the huge most part, and uh, we have to applaud them. And they've taken so much abuse and flack over the last couple of years. Even where we're seeing that that that, that fellow that testified, uh, you know, we haven't even gotten to that part yet of the the hearings coming up, which are going to be going drilling down to that level in Georgia and the harassment and threats of local officials. Oh, Rosenberger. Died in the wool, yeah, of, of, yeah. of, of Republican um, functionaries in these states that are just designed to count the votes. Uh, yeah. The, the, now, there's some know, real what, heroes that have emerged out of this in the last 17 months, and, and Liz Cheney certainly is one of them. Regardless if she retains her seat in Wyoming as a senator, uh, she'll go down in history as a, a true patriot, uh, certainly not with the principles I, I line up with, but as a patriot of democracy in the Republic, uh, she'll go down in history. Uh, no two ways about it. Speaking That's of history, right. yeah. you know, William Barr is coming out of this as, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to think of back in the days when um, Robert McNamara, um, you know, he kind of tried to redefine his role in the Vietnam War and, and not really telling the public how the war was going. He was in charge of, you know, de- you know, he was uh, the Defense Department, Secretary of Defense, and he was partly responsible for the cover up of what was occurring in Vietnam and how we were not winning the war there. And then he came out, you know, years later and kind of tried to, um, I don't know, polish it up, uh, spin it, that his role. And I'm getting the sense that Bill Barr is doing the same. What are your impressions of Bill Barr and his testimony uh, concerning Donald Trump and the insistence of his big lie? Well, you know, like I said, he got he got a lot of stuff wrong over the last uh, when he was in power. And he really had some policies that I don't think were in the best interest of America. But he was the attorney general at that time. But for this last one and this this really important thing, which was our time here is done. We lost fair and square. He told it to Donald Trump many times in many different ways. Uh, as he stated very clearly, uh, he stated, you know, talked about the different lawsuits. He sent out his own investigators really looking for something. Is there any there there? He categorically found there was nothing there. I thought when when the uh, when they rolled the comments of the federal judges, a huge number of which have been appointed by Donald Trump saying this is just 
pure shibai, right? And, uh, and, and the comments that they were rolling from the judges was so telling. These are people who have access to all types of, of information that are in a position to judge these things very carefully. And they did. Uh, Bill Barr's whitewashing of them, himself well, you know what, it, it, it just is. But if he's coming through at the end here and saying this is, uh, this is actually what happened. And, and you know, as Cynthia was saying the the um, the target audience is history. I think that is one target audience. But as David Brooks had a very good column in the New York Times a couple of days ago, and he said, I don't care who sent an email or a text when on January sixth. I want them to address the ongoing coup attempt of, of these these elections we're seeing right now where we, you're having people these acolytes it's just as if you know that the beast was unleashed and it was it's a hydra so you know and and they're literally running for office saying if i don't like the results i will simply ignore the will of the voters and and put uh these these folks in office that's really where the damage is, is that the done. value of these hearings is to say you know there's ongoing attempts to um, to thwart a free democratic election? Well, that's where the dots have to be connected because I think it's probably beyond the purview of this, but not necessarily because it's a logical, it, it, it is the next step that says, here, go in from every every level, go into uh, school boardrooms or a school, uh, school boards, onto you know, your local city councils, onto the state government uh, uh, levels, and and put enact these policies that are uh, detrimental to a uh, free and functioning society. So I think it is natural to make those connections. But hopefully, hopefully, um, like Cynthia says, we probably pay attention to this uh, more than the average Joe. You had 20 million people watching it. So how many people are in this country? Let's sort of round up to 400 million. So you've got five percent of the people. But are those? Is this going to be reaching the elusive soccer? parents right mm -hmm. who who were sitting there and they're like yeah well i really don't like the the swamp and i appreciated donald trump trying to drain the swamp but this was too much mm -hmm. putting this all together in a logical coherent non-hysterical uh fact-laden uh series of of of, of um, hearings i want to buy the commemorative edition honestly but if just people watch this and they see <laughs> wow I thought that guy was his uh, his acolyte. That was his number one deputy. And now he's saying, wait a minute here. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't Bill Barr at one point say he thought he had lost it or that he was um, delusional or something to that right. effect? Like, just OK, well, let's go, let's go to this, because, you know, what came out of this in this testimony and certainly on the second, you know, the last hearing was this notion that there was team normal and team crazy. And, you know, that kind of catches the American public's interest, like. Team normal and team crazy. Who was on team crazy? Well, it was uh, drunk Rudy on election night and uh, Sidney Powell. You know, that was part of team crazy. And then, you know, you had um, Bill Sipion as uh, team normal, and they were trying to convince Trump that stop, you know, stop saying these things about, uh, you know, fraud. And we don't even know what's going on. Uh, it's still election night and, and nothing's been formally, you know, closed out. But uh, Trump didn't want to listen to that. So I guess the question is, if there was a team normal, and if Bill Barr was part of team, team normal, they certainly didn't come out and say anything as Trump started to peddle out the big lie. They were complicit with the big lie because, I don't know, maybe as a consultant, you just want to stay on the payroll and uh, damn the democracy, you're, you're getting paid. Uh, your thoughts on that, Winston? Um, why do you think team normal basically went along with team Trump on his big lie? Uh, you know, narrative. Well, you got to look at when. Do, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I just you just you got to look at when did they quit? When did they really express their reservations about this? And uh, you know what? What day did Bill Barr quit? It was January first or fourth, or I, I can't remember when he quit. December something. Um, why didn't they come out very forcefully in the media saying this was wrong? Uh, but you 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 also have to remember that at the time, you have this entire bellows stoking the nation, saying this was stolen, this was fake, and here's our all our information. But if there had been a concerted attempt by Team Normal to come out at that time, maybe we would have head, headed this off mm -hmm. already. So well, I, the, I think that's the point. You know, this whole thing could have been head off 
Um, and I, I think you make a great point on that. Cynthia, you were you had an opinion about this topic about team normal versus team crazy. Um, same question to you. Uh, why do you think team normal didn't spark up and say, I mean, I know they'd be out of a job, they'd be terminated immediately, but didn't they have a duty to the American public? So there must have been some sort of threat behind it that wouldn't let them, something that would compromise themselves, right? Well, Donald Trump can't have dirt on everybody because that's, that's the kind of the mantra of why people uh, fall in line with Donald Trump, that he's got some kind of hold or uh, dirt or hypnotic effect on him. Um, can't have it on everybody, though, can he? Well, anybody that didn't come out when they should have, he can say, well, you're complicit because you didn't say anything back then, so you're just as guilty. So I think the threat element is there. And you hear them say the reason that they didn't do it was because they wanted to be able to stay and keep breaks on the crazy. They wanted to think that they could somehow keep it from getting so outrageous. And I don't, I don't know if I really buy into that too much because like Esper came out with this book saying all this stuff and it's like, well, why, why didn't you come out and say something? Well, I wanted to see if I could at least, you know, keep it from going out of control completely. And I guess I kind of give that to them, but it's, it doesn't ring true to me, that mm -hmm. little factoid that they're trying to put out there as to why they didn't come forward. So maybe some of them, it's true. They just thought they could help if they stayed and didn't want to lose their jobs. Or maybe they really were complicit in part of it. And that's all it would take. Is to well, and maybe it's a lesson for government and those who work in an administration, I don't care if it's Democratic or GOP, is, you know, it's the John Deans that knew they were crossing a line. They didn't know it well enough, but they knew they were doing something wrong. And they went along because they didn't want to fall out of favor. Uh, there's a, there's a, an intoxicating effect that you're, you know, you're working with closely with the president of the United States and you want to make the president of the United States happy. And, you know, John Dean of the Watergate fame was certainly that attorney that didn't want to put up roadblocks and then be thrown out of the game. So isn't that, a, isn't that a ploy or a play, not a ploy, but a play to um, administration individuals' egos and the, you know, the power, the getting drunk with power scenario. How do we stop yeah, that? Go. How do we stop that? That's the one, power. The entire Republican party sacrificed their integrity to get their judges and you know, to get what they wanted. They were willing to sacrifice their integrity for that. And so any Republican or any member of the guy's you know, administration was power hungry with this. They've already, they've already sacrificed their integrity. So they're all in at this point. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's part of it too. So the only thing they left is their historic succeed. reputation maybe. Well, partly, but so they thought it could succeed and then they could stay in power. Right, and it's that that draw of the power out there. Like, well, maybe we can make this work, and then we'll all be, you know, set for life with this job. I think that might have been part of it too. Just that that power, absolute power, corrupts absolutely. And I think these people were corrupted absolutely. So yeah, I think that might have been part of it. Yeah, no, that's a great point, uh, Winston. We had twenty million viewers on uh, the first night of the hearings. Uh, Clearly, I think that's a bigger audience than anyone anticipated. Uh, beat out the uh, NBA championship games, which is, you know, that's quite a high viewership. Do you think the interest of these hearings is just confirmation and uh, of what people already know and makes them feel better? Or is there a new audience that um, independents and or some of the old GOP that have some integrity left, uh, are they watching? Who do you think our audience, I know we talked a little bit uh, who the audience may be, but who do you think uh, this 20 million might comprise of? It's a good question. And I didn't see a breakdown as to who was actually watching this um, yet, uh, an elaborate breakdown. But uh, let's just assume that Fox News got the message because they carried the other hearing. Now they, they said, oh, we couldn't carry it because our, the first one, because our host controlled their shows. Okay, whatever. But uh, they carried the second one, which is quite interesting. And I saw the, 
I did watch Fox uh, with Brett Bear debriefing it with uh, two blonde ladies, and and basically they were they had to tread very gingerly because their colleagues are implicated in this. I mean, their 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 texts to Donald Trump are, are there. So Sean you know, Hannity I, comes to mind. Exactly, and at the at the end of the day, though, you know what we're watching is uh, is we we need to look at this as Americans and say, okay, what kind of society do we really want to live in here? Do we value free and fair elections, regardless of who you, uh, is in office. And, and it's, uh, let's just say, okay, this is the mess that we've got right now. So this is helping us understand where we're at. What are we gonna do from here? How are we gonna make it better? How are we gonna all get on the same page that we can understand that elections are not stolen or, or the, 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 the switch flipped and all the, the, the theories that have been debunked. I think that that's where maybe the, the benefit of these hearings will be that they're being presented in a way that is um, for the public to understand this happened. Now what? Now what are we going to do with this? And so it's not, to I don't think Donald Trump will run again, um, but he's got a lot of other people out there who are still part of this whole denier thing and they're beholden to him. But as we saw in the, elect in the uh, um, you know, election results of yesterday, you don't necessarily have to hold on to Donald Trump anymore to win as a Republican. You can go back to the conservative values um, and, and sort of skirt this for right now until he's out of public consciousness enough. I don't know mm -hmm. that, that that's going to happen, but um, these hearings, if it does happen, will be part of that you know, reason why that happens. Sometimes when you, you get into these hearings and you hear testimony, things one thing leads to another. And I saw the door opening on that uh, on this week, when um, you've gone from sedition and Trump's involvement with sedition to basically take a, an avenue over to the big lie became the big ripoff, which is to say they raised 200 million, $250 million for the Trump defense of the big lie. Stop the Steal was the name of it. And $250 million was raised only to find out that a lot of that money went to Trump hotels. Um, What's uh, Trump Jr.'s uh, girlfriend's name? Guilfoyle. Guilfoyle. She got a 60K speaking uh, role and for 60000 um, You know, Al Capone never went to prison for any involvement with a murder. He went to prison regarding tax evasion. Uh, does this take, take on another flavor with uh, a prosecuting attorney in, say, New York or somewhere else? Winston. It very well may. We'll have to see about that. Um, mm -hmm. I would still guess that at the end of the day, Donald Trump is not going to be in a prison. He might be indicted, though, and he might undergo some sort of trial, but it will have to be undertaken very carefully with the same sober level that we're looking at right now. But when you have people that just say this is just total fake news and more fake news, I'm not sure that uh, we have to find out what is the best way to reach those folks to let them know this there were there were crimes committed here and but if they don't believe it it may not make a difference he's not going to go to to prison but he might be indicted and unable to run that said you've got 40 percent of the country that still thinks it, his approval rating is higher now than it was on january 6 which is really shocking and just speaks to the the need to educate our our fellow um countrymen and women as to uh, you know what's going on but maybe after this and COVID, we're just kind of needing to turn a new page. And if we can just turn this, this dangerous corner coming up in the next year or two, three, we might stand a chance. But we're looking at a fundamental, I think, change in the psyche of American society that is being played out in the Supreme Court and the composition of that, as well as what's going to come up in these next elections. So we just have to stand by and we'll stand by. Yep. Yeah. OK, thank you, Winston. Cynthia, we've come out of run out of time, but I want to get your any of your last thoughts on this topic? Um, I know you had a couple quotes, things that you think that are important to point out before the show concludes. I thought it was very powerful to have all the Capitol policemen sitting in the front two rows during the entire thing. I thought that was a real important statement to make. These were people that got hurt. These were law enforcement. So all your blue wave love is wrong. You know, this whole blue line, staying with the blue line, we're all about law and order. It was policemen that were injured. 
And so instead of just having them come in to be there for the questioning part, they were there in the audience just, mm -hmm. and I wonder if they're gonna be there through the whole thing. I think they might be. So a couple other things that I think are important and just crazy. It's another part of the crazy coming out of all of this. Peter Navarro has now had made an official charge, has a, a, a suit against the January 6th committee and Nancy Pelosi, because he's saying that they are maligning his character or whatever, just because they're stating the facts of what happened. And so he's trying to throw shade out there. Yeah, his actions maligned his character. Exactly, thank you very much. And I think it's important to remember there is so much stuff that has come out of this insurrection. Um, just, was it yesterday or day before, I guess it was yesterday, they stopped, was it 20 old father guys that were going to, I can't remember what, they're not oath keepers. They're yeah, old, no. They're, old, they're out of the Hayden Lake area. Yeah, they yeah, came all over from everywhere. They were, they were all a bunch of, with riot gear in waiting in a, um, in a, a van, in a U-Haul van to go and, a, and make trouble and attack. And who knows if they would have hurt people or they were prepared to, they had plenty of stuff to hurt people um, in that, that gay pride, uh, in a pride uh, uh, rally that they were having. And it just, that one just struck me this morning really yeah. hard. I thought, this isn't just about January 6th. This is about what's happening in our country that's profoundly affecting the electorate in, in dangerous, dangerous ways. Yeah. And I think this one that, thank goodness they've got a good handle on investigative intelligence to be able to know it was going to happen. And it was just a tip from someone. So I really want to enforce that if you see something, say something, right, to people so that yeah. if you see something, say something. It was an anonymous tip from yeah, good point. somebody that saw it. Good okay, point. so my closing, closing quote is from Stephen Colbert, because as you guys know, the way I handle all of this is I watch the comedy at night and it somehow makes it so that it's a little more palatable, right? And so Stephen Colbert last night says, uh, so 20 million people watched and he's so grateful. He's just want to express my gratitude to the committee. We all know about all of this, but watching the way they put it all together reminds us that we're not crazy. <laughs> yeah, we're not. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, Winston, you get the last word. Well, I'd say stay tuned. Um, watch what's going on. Educate yourselves. Ask your friends. Okay, U.S. has 331 million people. I rounded too far up, but let's just say we need a lot more than 20 million watching this. We need 100 million or 200 million watching this. This is real history, like Cynthia said, to bleed over into our society right now and all these different areas where people feel that it's it's fine to just uh, if you don't like someone, do whatever you want. It's just like a free society. If we will do whatever you want, no consequences. That's the message that we can't really have here. Uh, that's the message that we need to rein in people and say, this is not the country we want. We want a country that aspires to its best and highest ideals. And that's what this commission is all about. Just finding the, the facts and letting the American people know what they are so that we can course correct as a nation. Yeah, great point. The world is watching our society, our democracy. We are that shining city on the hill, hopefully still. And your point is well, well taken, Winston. Thank you so much. All right, we've won out of time and 28 minutes certainly isn't going to be enough time to cover this topic, but we'll have to take another crack at it again. So I hope you'll join us. I'd like to thank Winston Welch for rejoining us here on American Issues, take one. And I'd like to thank Cynthia Lee Sinclair for always her great comments. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you for both of you to join us. Uh, would you please join us next Wednesday at 11 o'clock? And I'm Tim Apicella, and we hope to see you then. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.